So let's catch, catch this first caller. Caller, you live on the air. Tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Lufus, and uh, my question to Rabbi is concerning Paul's uh, Damascus Road experience and what uh, his thoughts on that are. I recently heard him say that uh, mental illness was a huge problem. So I just want his thoughts on Paul's Damascus Road experience. Okay, very good. All right, go ahead and hang up now. You can tune in for your answer. As it turns out, that event never happened. In fact, Paul never mentions the Damascus Revelation in his own letters. The Damascus story is found in three places in the book of Acts. Acts 9, 22, and 26. It's not in Paul's letters. It's not that Paul doesn't say that Jesus revealed himself to him. He does, and he says it repeatedly. In fact, Paul wants you to know that the revelation he had was, and he says this with a very humble tone, was greater than anyone else. And he refers to his competitors. And in the case of Paul, his competitors were not the Jews who weren't Christians, but were fellow Christians. Paul was a very disagreeable person and was somebody who really did not get along, didn't play well with other people. And by Paul's own statements, you could see this, that Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, and among the 13 letters attributed to Paul, Galatians is certainly from his hands. In the book of Galatians, chapter 2, he brags how he told Peter off to his face and showed how he was a hypocrite and wrong. And that was very important to bring out and to mock uh, the other apostles as the so-called pillars of the church. The point of Paul here and in other places is to point out that his revelation is superior because what he has is directly from Jesus. So he's going to repeat that not only in Galatians 1 and 2, in Philippians 3, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the smartest guy in the class. And he does talk about persecuting Christians. That I don't doubt, meaning I don't doubt that Paul was just someone who was just, you, you didn't want to have dinner with who was just a very disagreeable person. But when he found his own niche and a way of seizing power, that's why people are so disagreeable like Paul, then his adversaries became fellow Christians. This is not me saying this. This is found in the Christian literature, in not just any Christian literature. I'm, just, I'm not talking about the church fathers. And I'm not talking about the apostolic fathers. I'm talking about the actual canon itself. I mean, the very person who introduced Paul to the disciples and convinced them to even have a conversation with him is Barnabas in Acts 9.26. But Paul has a sharp falling out with him, the same, very same guy, in, at the end of Acts chapter 15. I mean, it says it in the text. How likely is it that someone would make that up? It's so embarrassing. He wouldn't travel with John Mark, who's Barnabas' cousin. He, he couldn't get along with fellow Christians and, and berated the Galatians, whom he's preaching to in the book of Galatians in chapter 3, who bewitch you, O foolish Galatians. What is he screaming about? He's screaming about the fact that the churches in, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, that he created eventually came into contact with other Christians who conveyed to them that they ought to be keeping the Torah or to be revering the Torah is something that they ought to be keeping. And Paul couldn't stand Torah observance. He hated it. In Colossians 2, verse 16, 17, Paul says, Let no one judge you according to the food that you eat, the drink that you consume, or regarding any festival, or new moon, any Shabbat. They're only a shadow of things that are to come. They intrinsically have no purpose. The whole point of it all is pointed to Christ. The substance is in Christ. Those are not my words. That comes 
directly from a letter of Paul. Paul encourages his fellow Jews who are Christians in the book of Romans in chapter 7, urging them not to keep the law and using an example of someone who is married whose spouse has died, and therefore that person is no longer bound to their marriage vows, encouraging them to abandon the law, which has become a curse for Paul. It is much more convincing for the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts is really called the book of the Acts of the Apostles. That's, that's its full name, but it really shouldn't be called that at all. It should be the book of the Acts of Paul. <laughs> Actually, that name was taken by a f another fake book, but this one is like a really a, a pseudepigrapher um, from the second century. But the whole book, really, the book of Acts, is really about Paul and how Paul's Christology is the one that would hold, would hold sway over the church. And Paul wins this battle with his contemporaries. You can see that because not only do we have 13 books in the New Testament that claim to be written by Paul, but you have the book of Hebrews, which was certainly not written by Paul. The early church thought it was written by Paul. Not all church fathers thought that way, but the church fathers who believed that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul ultimately won the day and got the book included in the canon. Second Peter is there to prop up Paul as being the top disciple, see Second Peter 3.15. That's a huge chunk of the Christian Bible is really about Paul and his opponents, his interlocutors, again, were fellow Christians who he couldn't get along with. The reason why you have the, that story of the road to Damascus, which couldn't have happened, it couldn't, the story could not have happened because a high priest would have would not be sending anybody to Damascus to persecute Christians. That story is ridiculous. The high priest would have been a Sadducee. The high priest would not be working with someone who claims to be a Pharisee. And the high priest in Jerusalem would have absolutely no authority over anyone in Damascus. The whole story is completely concocted. And that's why you don't have that or other things in the letters of Paul. You don't have you know, the claim that Paul was a disciple of Rabbi Gamaliel in Paul's letters. Paul doesn't even make that claim. Why doesn't he make that claim in his letters? Because all of Paul's indisputed letters are written in the 50s, and Rabbi Gamaliel was still alive in the 50s. So that's like saying that you're a student of Einstein. Rabbi Gamaliel was the Einstein of his generation. He was the greatest giant. There were many giants, but he was the giant of the generation. That would have been an outrageous claim. Now, once the book of Acts is written in the book in, let's say, I don't know, 85, 90, you can, so 85, 90, that's 30 years, 35 years after the letters of Paul, and everyone is dead. You can write anything you want to. So when you gather all the information together that we find in the Christian Bible, it's very hard to weed out anything that's true, like how could you look at a book that you know is pregnant with fiction, overlaid with mythology? Can you in some way find something that actually is historical in some way? And the answer is you can. There are, there are a criteria that are so rigorous that it's, it's inconceivable, for example, that these stories I've described where Paul is fighting with John Mark won't travel with as a split with Barnabas and they just part ways and never see each other again. It's inconceivable that someone would invent something so, uh, so embarrassing or someone would interpolate Paul's confrontation with Peter or that Paul would refer to the church in Jerusalem as the so-called pillars of the church. and That's just too embarrassing. That's a very, very rigorous method. There's no reason to have invented that. Paul was just a very disagreeable person. Paul was someone who could not get along with others, and it was because Paul wanted power. And the only people Paul got along with in the New Testament is really women. 
Women were his companions who were around him constantly. And, and I think the reason for that, that he got along with women so well, is because women didn't threaten him. In that kind of a society, women would not have opposed him, would not have expressed their opinions against him. But he's just one of these very disagreeable people who we could see his enemies, those who disagree with him, were fellow Christians who held a very different Christology. Now, to add to his credibility, not only is he going to advance the notion that he was the smartest boy in the class, he was zealous for the law far beyond any of his peers. But when he found out that he could have power and strong leadership position as a, a Christian to get Jewish people, and then Gentiles, more importantly, away from keeping the law, that would explain everything. And that's why, as an example, when we go back and visit Acts chapter 15, we're at the end of the chapter, we find that Paul and Barnabas part ways for unpleasant reasons. But Acts 15 is much more famous because of the ecumenical council that occurs earlier on in the chapter where Christians gather together to settle a problem in the early church where some Christians, this would be a very early church, a very primitive iteration of Christianity, believe that if you wanted to be a Christian, you had to become a Jew first. You had to be circumcised. You had to keep the law in order to become a believer in Jesus. I mean, to be a Christian, we're going to use the word Christian now, even though there's nowhere where Christians call themselves Christians in the New Testament. We, we need to use conventional language. So it's not that Christian is not mentioned in the Christian Bible. It's mentioned three times in the New Testament, but in all of those three occasions, it is a term not used by Christians. So, But we're going to use that term. So as it turns out that the earliest Christians thought that, well, if you want to become a, a believer in the Messiah, you had to become a Jew to be a Christian. And it was resolved that Paul's way was the way, and everybody is on the same page, and that's why that would contribute to Second Peter 3.15. But it was also resolved that all these former pagans had to do was to keep, essentially keep the Noahide laws. Now, the Noahide laws, that term is not mentioned there, but the laws that you find there about morality and not engaging in theft and stealing and e eating from what is germane is eating from meat that was offered to idols. That's absolutely forbidden to a non-Jew under the Noahide laws. If an animal was sacrificed to Jupiter, you, a Jew or a Gentile would be forbidden to eat from that meat. But we see then when Paul is writing to his followers in Corinth, in a very important chapter in 1 Corinthians 8, he said, very much you can eat from that kind of meat, and if you don't think it's there anything, and you can do it. Well, that goes right against Acts 15. I mean, right slam dunk against it. So these are not, you know, and the, the, I'm not going to go, I can go on for hours about the difference between Acts and Paul. How frequently did Paul come to Jerusalem? What was the nature of his visits? I'm not going to go into it now. The idea of the of that Paul had this revelation on a road to Damascus sent by the high priest in Jerusalem was invented along the way, and that's why you don't see that in Paul's own letters. It was really important to get it in there by whoever wrote the book of Luke. So, no, the story never happened, but I don't attribute Paul's supposed revelation on the road to Damascus to mental illness in a, in a sense of psychosis that I do attribute to Mary Magdalene, who I think was the first person to have that, uh, to feel like her, the person who she adored visited her, and I think that she's the one who went around convincing everyone that Jesus appeared to her. I, no, I don't attribute that to Paul. Paul is just a very disagreeable person, but that type of story was typical mythology in the ancient world, and eventually it gets applied to Paul and makes its way into the Christian canon by the year 85 
thanks to the author of the book of Acts. Let it be that we should come to a time when the world will realize that this is all nonsense. The teachings of Paul are an anathema to the prophets of Israel, and we should see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimheda Biyameno, quickly in our time. Great question. <music> 